the milk screaming, and that means we're live. Welcome, folks, to Ratchet Radio, Argent Dawn's occasional podcast. Tonight's show is sponsored by the Fallen Leaf. You've never had a more honorable bunch of warriors than these lot. Trust me, I tried to bribe them and got a knuckle sandwich for my troubles. So sit back, relax, and enjoy these upstanding gents blathering for the next hour or so. Remember, keep it snappy, boys. The boss wants you out of here by eight. Hello there, Argent Dawn. We are Ratchet Radio, and we are back on the air. Thank you very much for the intro by the fantastic Goblins. How are you doing, folks? We are fine. Today, we've had a bit of a sickness come over us. We've lost the, our resident Irishman, and we've lost our resident elf. Or the original one, should I say. But don't worry, folks. I'm still here, and we've got Edrisal, and we've got a fantastic guest host for us today. So, Edrisal, say hello, mate. Hello. Um, Sorry, was that all I was meant to say? I should have said something yeah, more interesting. Yeah, it's, it's, no, it's fine, it's fine. We'll get on to it later. And our other guest host today is... Sean, you there, mate? Sean? Yes, I am here. I was just thinking you were going to name me. No, no, no. I am Sean by your lane. Great. Well, that works. <laughs> yeah, we've got Yay. it. Cool, sweet. Um, shall we get on to what is happening? What are we going to be doing today? So we've got, our, as usual, we've got our alliance news, we've got the horde news, and then we've got a good old guest interview, and then we will also bring you back debate of the day. We missed that, I think, week two and week three. And as promised last episode, I will bring you some Warlords of Draenor lore. This week we'll be featuring the seven warlords. Um, there was something else. No, I don't think there's anything else. I think that's it. We've got anything else down, just in case. We'll probably think of something. Something will yes, come up. Yes, there was. It, it, the other thing was any other business, which is on my list. Fantastic. Sweet. Let's go. Right, so we are going to be starting off with uh, Alliance News. So, Grandpa, go straight ahead. Get into it. Yes. Now, due to the sudden illness I've had to pull together at the last minute, and this isn't exactly going to be the best thing in the world, but what I found on the Alliance is that we've got an upcoming event which is the Stormwood Poetry Appreciation Society. Now I was going to go do Argent Archives for this because it's a fantastic tool, but sadly it's down for maintenance at the moment, so I'm going to have to go off what is on the forum thread. So it's by Bertle the Gnome from Gnomish Rescue Squad. Hello there my friend, welcome to the show if you're listening. Come, and he says, come to the first ever meeting and in the new started Stormed Poetry Appreciation Society and share your poems and songs or just show your support and sit in to, sit in to appreciate and listen. Everything is acceptable, be it your favourite poem or your own song. OOC detail, just show up or send an in-game mail to Bertle with a sample of your work. Place at the back of the main district, it's in Stormwind at the pond. Oh yeah, I know what that is. And it is on Thursday, the eighth of May, at eight, eight, twenty hundred hours server time, which is nineteen hundred GMT or BST as it is now. And there is an Arch and Archive link, which I'm sure we can include in the description below. Uh, that's number one. Number two was a Noble Garden Ball, which was hosted. Uh, I can't remember who it was hosted by. I think it was hosted by Lady Sasha Hymir. And it was an interesting event. Uh, I'm Oras, I think, was doing a DM event again, and it's fun. According to the thread, which is a Storm and Tabloid thread, we'll include that in the link below, because it's quite an interesting read. Quite eventful. There were some murders, there was some um, historic house trashes, there was evidence of biological science transfusion cyborg thing, which is interesting. And it, it took place. Oh yes, it was hosted by Love of the Light, and it took place in in uh, Caspeland Manor, which was in Gilnes, and it was it seemed like a good time. I was going to go myself, but sadly exams got in the way. Exams, you know, um, they they get in the way of a lot of things. I feel this is the exam period. Yeah. So, and also that reminds me, Argent Dawn, our actual radio will be continuing during the exam period. We'll do our best. Just all of us have got commitments. We will do our best to get our shows out to you. That is a promise I can give you now. Uh, and that's pretty much Alliance news. Alliance, you're quiet. Come on. If you if you do, Alliance, if you're doing something, let me know. Let one of us know. We want to want to feature it. We want to get your name out there. 
We do I have know. an email, don't we? Do you, do we do have an email, which Andrigo was meant to give me before we started, which he hasn't, so I'm going to have to go check on the original forum thread. Give me five minutes. Isn't it like Ratchet Radio at, at something.com? Uh, Ratchet Radio EU at uh, gmail.com. Uh, is it that? <laughs> I think so. Um, this is what happens when suddenly illness strikes everyone down within a matter of moments. Exactly, and it's, a, it's such a bad timing as well. But you know what? We're, at least we're at least we're actually recording, and which is uh, amazing. Uh, definitely. Um, and just in honour of the fact that we haven't had any Irish person in this radio for a long time, I'm going to be coming now and again to you know speak on behalf of Andrew. So, so it's going to be like, uh, well, I, don't, I don't even feel comfortable doing this now. I feel I feel so on edge. I don't if, I don't know if I can pull it off. Do you think I can pull it off, Grandpa? Do you think I could I could do the Irish? Just do the damn thing. I don't know if I can. I'm nervous now. Sean, give me a hand here. Can he do it? <laughs> well, um, here is where I can say that I am Italian and you've spoken too quickly. But I will give you a suggestion about the email. You see, since this is going to be on YouTube, you should just write it over the video part so that everyone will know about it and everyone can write to you in advance if they want their event advertised through this new media that Arjun Dawn is uh, is getting that is a service yeah no that's a great idea I think we I think we should I think we need to do that well we have done that in the past we've put the uh, email um... it's been offered but according to them we haven't got any emails which is annoying Sad. I know, it was quite depressing. I was getting ready to read through them, trawl through them. We were going to have a mailbox section and everything for episode three. And then that failed and to, I got sad. To be sure, James, I, I don't know if I can I can handle this. Oh, <laughs> that, it, that, yeah. was <laughs> that was my um, attempt. You were far better earlier. I know, um, why, why am I so much better earlier? Oh, well. <laughs> you're useless. Um, I'm so useless. Um, I'm if I can yet... I'm sorry, but I think about the emails, just organizative thing, which uh, would not be so interested by being whoever is listening. Uh, it's just you have to create one email and get it sorted. Ah, here it is. Found it. Yeah. It is ratchetradioad at gmail.com. Well, at least that we got is it now. AD at gmail.com. Of course, it will most likely appear on an annotation. If we can remind Andrigo to put it on, and I will make sure it's in the description, or at the very least, I will stick it down personally in the comments. He's going to kill me for trying to imitate him. I, I know he is. I've done, I've, done, I've done such a bad job. I had it so perfectly earlier, because no one... I say no one's listening, no one's listening now. I just... I just such stage fright. Anyway, we should, um, we should move on to Horde News <laughs> and distract me from attempting to be Andrigo. Again. Okay, so Horde News. Um, so one of the major things that we've seen um, recently is uh, the Sunhawk Ball, and I was there, along alongside a few other elves. Um, Grandpa was. And also, I was there as well. Yeah, Grandpa was there as well. We all on our characters, and I thought it was very well organised. And I don't know if you guys remember a long time, um, maybe not a long time ago, but a year ago, uh, we um, the Everdawn organised a Midsummer Ball, and. Um, we got a lot of good response and a lot of people came and I think one of the most unfortunate decisions we made was putting it in the exchange. Um, I really liked the choice of location, it was nice, it was very peaceful. Um, as with all of those big events, you know, you do get chat spam but I had a really good time. You could mingle and talk to people, unfortunately IC led to IC and Edwards will have to leave. You, you you did kick off about halfway through. Yeah, that that, that, that happened, yeah. But it, I thought it was a really good event, and I thought it was very well organised, and it took a lot of effort. Um, now, I've, I've also found out who won, so very, a massive congratulations to Amre and Avron, and the Veltheron Redhawk. So, you know, <laughs> congratulations. You are the king and queen of the Sunhawk Ball. So, but um, overall, I was generally like really happy. I thought it was very well organized. You know how you separated appetizers and drinks. It was it was nice. I mean, I can imagine that the the cost might be quite high. Uh, I don't want to see your bills at the end of that, unless 
you have a lot of land and rich estates paid for by, I don't know, maybe Felicia's family. Um, but it was, yeah, it was very, it was very good. I know, I know it, it costs a lot from the IC perspective, but um, yeah, I thought it was great overall, really good initiative. Um, one of the next things that I wanted to talk about and we've been asked to do um, or advertise about it is the Goblin Barbecue Festival. Yeah, yeah, I'll interrupt here. Stop spamming my AA inbox. I get it. I put it on my list. It is going to be mentioned now. Exactly. So please, stop. <laughs> My AA box can only take so much before I want to explode. Yeah, so, I think it's the it's the Iron Vulture that's that's hosting it, uh, and they've got a, a, a really nice, uh, well organised um, thread, which is great. So it's got its first. Um, so the first bit is obviously the Arjun Archives link to it, which is the event, and then it obviously tells you the setting um, and where you might see this information. The note, all I see, very goblin-like, enjoyable, love it, um, fantastic, and it also contains this. Um, um, well, a celebration of the the game event, which is what people, you know, at least Horde side and Spine of Candle would um would have seen. Um, oh, Alliance knows it too. Does Alliance know it as well? I did not know that. The gnomes were the gnomes were fighting the goblins for it. Too. Yeah, exactly. So I guess I guess maybe the Alliance, the Alliance know about it. Of course. Um, so the date is on the tenth of May, um, and it's at twenty. Hundred hours, round uh, time. Round time, yeah. So basically, eight o'clock in the evening, or seven o'clock GMT, or whatever. Why has it been changed to something different? I don't want to know. You it's, know it's BS. It, I'll explain to you after. Explain to me after. This is really confusing. Um, yeah. So I think one of the major things that I wanted to pick up about it is that it's got this really cool idea, which is, you know, these stools, which I think, from the looks of it, are player made. Like it's not. Obviously, it's not. You know. Um, um, it's not like uh, uh, the stalls aren't hosted by Iron Vulture itself. There's other people that can get involved, and you know the shops and uh, other things. I think one of th I saw the, uh, the freelancers have got yep. some sort of um, a uh, uh, merc like handing out mercenary contacts, which is which is really cool. And I like the idea of that. And I'm very tempted to go on that with my undead to have a look. Yeah, you've got. Big names such as the freelancers, Dark Moon Company. You've got the Fable Wind there. You've got the Clockwork Collective. I mean, you've got, and you've got some workshops which apparently involves troll dancing. So if you ever want to just throw yourself off to enhance stands or go to along to this event, it sounds like it sounds like fun anyway. I might roll a goblin especially for it. Um, I'm not gonna lie there, Grandpa. You just. <laughs> you just lagged really badly for me, and when you were saying it, it sounded like you were a sheep. Cause it, yeah, exactly, but like really long. So do you want to just repeat that? Because um, yeah, yeah. unfo unfortunately yeah. the Venture Co. still feel like they need to annoy us with their disruptions. So do you want to say that? Just say that again. Right. And if, if, if uh, maybe potentially, if Andrigo is feeling wonderfully special and fantastic, and maybe if I woo him with another attempt at his Irish voice, because I'm Andrigo. Um, <laughs> that was far better. <laughs> I feel a bit more confident in it. If he wants to be amazing, <laughs> then he could potentially cut where we are now <laughs> and and put in your new bit and make it sound all flashy. So, in the same voice, repeat exactly what you just said. You do realise Ben will never do that. I know he would. This is terrible. <laughs> I shouldn't have done the Irish accent. Anyway, continue. I, I, um, um, um. And we've got big names there, such as the Freelancers, Dark Moon Company, uh, I've lost my place on the page, Sugar, the Fablewind Fair, and we've got the Clockwork Collective. There are big guilds here, uh, I think, uh, the Emerald, I think the Emerald, um, Tribe. Yeah, I think the Emerald Tribe are there as well. It should be fun, thank you very much for interrupting that, I should appreciate it, because I couldn't remember it for the life of me. I would go on the Everdawn, but frankly... You know, we've got bigger fish to fry, quite literally, than uh, a barbecue. You don't have anything to fry at the moment. Yeah, I know, I'm just trying to make up for the fact that I have nothing. Anyway, it sounds like a great event, and I'm really looking forward to it. Um, I might, I'm might, i going to probably pop by. I've got exams um, that start on the 13th, so I, I may probably you know stop by for a little while. But it, it looks great, and really, you know... Big, big round of applause to you guys for actually setting it up. I love these server um, initiatives. Right, so the final part of the um, of Horde 
is talking about um, this Koshag and for those who roleplay orc roleplay um, orc characters you'll know that a Koshag is a pretty important thing and it was where all the clans came together to enjoy festivities fights and everything and it, it's such a cool idea and I really loved it and um, you know Kagan who who set up you know he's a good friend of mine and you know I genuinely really liked the idea and I was gonna come uh, along um, but unfortunately it didn't it didn't really go ahead due to lack of support and I particularly want to say to the community and let me know if this if you agree with me but I'd love to see this happen and seeing that the horde nowadays is multicultural why don't um, and this is just a suggestion you don't have to take it on board but why not have a koshark where you know, it's not just orcs, it is the Horde itself, where they can come together and have a festivity. But it's a revolutionised Koshag. Something, you know, first of its kind, that'd be quite cool. Or, just keep it orc only. I mean, you know, it, maybe they would be allowed to see what happened but not take part. You know, there's all this cultural diversity which could be involved, could create drama, could not, could create something interesting. I don't know, but I think it was amazing. You know, the idea of fights, drinking, everything, it's perfect. It's like, for all of you who love you know, Viking Age, Scandinavia, and all of that sort of mythology of drinking, you know, fighting, and, you know, um, and all of that, uh, you, you'd love this, because that just kind of, it is the embodiment of it. Maybe a bit more tribal, as opposed to sort of medieval, but it's, it's amazing. I, I, I really like the idea. So that's, that's kind of something I wanted to put out there. So please do let us know in the comments below if you agree, and show some support for uh, Kagan in getting that um, back up and running or maybe convince them to do it another time so that's it for Horde um, now we're gonna sure. just wanna say something yeah sure R.I.P. Edrasil for suggesting orcs ch change their traditions and include people like elves and the rotting dead and even and even and even goblins the, the, and the pandas I'm gonna be murdered on my orc character because I'm in the you black will, jaw you will be if, you're, if your GM finds out you are you are dead Jorgen's gonna kill me yeah it's not gonna be great you know after all the support I've shown him I'm not just a filthy elf in the end um Sean you got something to say mate mm. yes about this um kosher griffing that if you ask me human paladin I am totally ignorant about it or in ignorant. Uh, I think a kind of festivity that um, tries to revamp the orcish spirit in a moderate form after the um, escalation that Garrosh had about the um, orcs being a superior race over the horde. Um, it should be actually done and it is a very good idea to be enacted, a sort of feast that could span over a few days with indeed tribal dancing and some kind of championships because the orcs are uh, full of pride and honor in their ways of life. Mm -hmm. um, I think it could be something which could uh, polish the horde roleplay and the orc side, uh, a form of reunion of orcs that uh, survived the um, Siege of Orgrimmar and that shattered and splitted uh, between the loyalists to the war chief and the one siding with the rebels. Uh, it should be taken as a form of uniting again the shattered orcs um, to regain also their spot in the horde, which eventually is now of being mistrusted. Who knows if this orc was in truth a loyalist of the war chief and now it's just hiding among us. Uh, it's just getting back that form of unity that has gone and could have been forgotten, casting the orcs into a not so trusted position among the horde. So I'd say, yeah, go for it, push for it. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't get much support, just get on with it and deliver it. Yep, that's the very good, the very wise words from you there, Sean. It's, um, you know, it is really good and I, I presume that you believe that it should just be orc only? Was that, well, am yes, I correct? Yes, I, yeah. I believe it should be a racial event, exactly mm -hmm. as we have racial guilds as of sentinels and things, where it should be things typical for mm -hmm. one race. Mm -hmm. um, and what do you think about the the horde guilds, like the maybe the Frozen Poor who have, who are a clan who also have Tauren 
and elves and other races in 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 the guild who maybe don't want to just take part even though they should be because they are an orc um guild what what do you think they should do do you think they should go or should they just not bother um the mixed guilds well this is where an event should not be for guilds but for one race mm -hmm. so eventually just a portion of a guild would get to the event uh, if it is an event spanning for two three four days it should not big harm for the guild the rest of the guild could even try to role play around like trying to watch from distance for example or linger about trying to sneak close enough and might be being shooed by the orcs because or trying to bargain in a way or another their access to the feast it is all a way to create role play um, the orcs would not have problems might be a tower could have Maybe this Tauren have earned this spot with orcs because in the past he has fought alongside them. I don't know. Uh, it all falls in the roleplay and mostly to create roleplay and involve people in a way or another. Yeah, that's that's a, a really good idea. Um, and I think I think you know that that would be amazing because if you if you think about it, if the orcs went on a pilgrimage, like we've got a Koshag, we want to go there, we want to take part in this ritual that. You know, some of us have been, some of the orcs were born in internment camps. They'd never seen one. Um, and if anyone has read any of the um, adventures that I've written about my character, Taurog, um, he was quite, he was, you know, semi young when the first, well, he wasn't really young. He, t he took part in the first war, but, you know, he was old enough to have taken part in the Koshag. And that's something that doesn't go away. It's a memory that sticks. And that's why he wanted to take part in the one that Kagan had organized. And I think this pilgrimage could provide role play for others to go oh well how are we going to react when our orcs have gone away or when our leader's gone and we are just here should we go follow them should we watch should we do whatever and i think that was a great idea sean so i i think kagan if you're listening or if anyone listening who might want to help him out please do take any of this on board or not it's up to you but i think i think there's some good discussion so anything else to add to the horde or alliance news before we move on Yes, you now I know what his him. name is. Hmm? You now know what his name is, you can now kill him. Who? Yours. It's Tarog. Oh, yeah. Hey, folks. Yeah. If they're suggesting that idea, you can now kill him. <laughs> as, as maybe Ben would say. Oh, no, I've, I've, I've lost it. I was going to try and do it again, but I just, I, I really, I really think <laughs> he's going to kill me. It's like, I'm Andrigo, and I'm pretty sure they're going to kill you. That was terrible. What is wrong with me? Okay, that... move on. Right, I can't do this. Oh. I said I was going to do this beforehand, but it's not going so well. Says the linguist. Just cry in the corner. I will cry in the corner. I will cry many tears. See, when I don't want it to be in, it goes fine. But when I want it to be in, it goes terrible. Alright, anyway, so let's move on. Yeah, it's so Anyway, shall we move on? So we've got our guest interview now. If you want, sure. I've got a few questions I want to ask you, Sean. I hope that's okay. Yeah, well, I am here for that, so let us proceed. Of course, right. So, Sean, um, tell us about the Baelane retinue. It's a household guild, one of the dreaded household guilds, which are really crowding the realm of late. But I think it's the oldest one of all of them. It started in June uh, 2010. So, four years ago, almost. Mm -hmm. We wear green, it's pretty unique, I dare say. Maybe there are some Kulturas guild with bean green, but we're forest green, it's better. Uh, we have a very cool web page, which we have powered that forth to enlighten people, just not only about the rules of the guild. Even if someone wants to interact with us, uh, there are the contacts about organizing events. Um, the way we uh, do events, even Dungeon Master system, we have an out of charter application form because, uh, for example, one of our, our policies is to value more the player than the charter. In the end of the day, yeah, in charter is in charter, out of charter is out of charter, but the character is a puppet. 
in the hands of a player. The player creates the character, shapes its background, can even opt to reroll one character from scratch, reboot it. Mm -hmm. Event of the day is the player that decides if to stick in one guild or not, if to adjust one character or not to keep in one guild. So this is one of our main points to value the player more than the character. Because let's also say it, there are okay. plenty of... Oh, okay. No, no, that, no, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, I was just saying oh. okay. <laughs> Um, um, my PAM I'm just digressing because I just went on some highway and went away from the guild. That's fine, man. I, I'm totally happy for you to go on a highway. If you want to make a road trip to you know Kingdom Come and keep going, then that's fantastic. That's why we do it. But um, if you want, um, I can move on to maybe you can say more of this because it feels like that's something something that you see as a goal. Am I right? So, is it like, do you want to tell us about the goals that the guild have now and maybe in the future? Um, Yes, but I can easily do, actually, since you have invited me here, I will give some spoilers that people around don't know, because this is something I have prepared since quite a while. Okay. Um, we, we're, we're very used to spoilers. Is... We're very used to spoilers. They have, they, have, <laughs> they have cropped up, unfortunately, many times in Ratchet Radio. So go ahead. And Windhelm Radio. And Windhelm Radio. Yeah, let's not talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> right, continue. Sorry, Sean. You keep going. <laughs> Don't worry. Uh, since Blizzard has this marvelous idea of getting these truths, which really fucks over all the military aspects, practically, because you cannot go and have campaigns and whatnot against the horde. Can't kick Not the shit. Anymore. Can't kick the yeah. shit out of the greenskins, basically, is what you're trying to say. Yeah, so one has to find some kind of alternative focus. Mm -hmm. After the Spine of Kalimdor campaign, which has served as some fights, now um, the green coats will serve a specific purpose, which is household centred for once. Or better, is very shown centred, because the war is not anymore here, there is no real duty to the king to be done. We could hunt some cultists, but there are not many cultists around right now. Uh, we have passed the Black Dragon and Kataki's Mage. So, since Sean's father has been missing in action long ago when he followed General Trillion in the Outlands, there will be this uh, rather massive Dungeon Master campaign, mm -hmm. storyteller driven, which will entail Sean by your lane trying to get in contact with his father, be it to find how he has de died, where, or if even possible to try to get in touch with the spirit of his father, exactly like at some point there is the father of Arthas' spirit speaking with a son, where it could happen even something similar at some given point. It depends how the story is unfolding. And on this note, I would like to underline um, for the first time we will have six slots open for non-gilded people to come along as auxiliaries, uh, call them mercenaries, contracted people. Uh, this because in this Dungeon Master campaign, which will be through more than one chapter, so we can rotate those outsiders, uh, we want to give the possibility to outsiders to explore our roleplay and our Dungeon Master system, um, which is quite unique, I think, in is, Agenda. Yeah. Um, without actually having to be in the guild. Then, if they like how we roleplay and how we do things, they can join the guild, obviously. But um, with a lot of prejudice that people have for the buyer in retinue, this could be their golden opportunity without being in the guild to get in contact, get in touch, and see what we truly are and not what people gossip us about. I think that's, I really respect your decision to do that because it's, it's you know, when you have people from the outside judge what happens on the inside, there's a lot of things that go on like, I don't know, hearsay. And, um, you know, they'll take they'll take that into response, and especially if you're so open for them to see what the guild is really like, where you have ungilded people, or not even ungilded people, but individuals who want to get involved. I, I think that's a great idea. Um, so, shall we move on then to another question? Um, 
what would you say the strongest aspect of uh, the guild is? It's a bit of double-edged knife. Um, I think one of the strongest aspect is that we are strict with our rules. Mm -hmm. We have many, many rules which have shaped one identity to the guild. Um, even just rules that if you are attacked in the middle of Cathedral Square, you just use the NPCs. We have rules about how you travel between places and where you're bound to role play. We have a dress code, a uniform. We have a lot of things which people should just go along with to keep in the guild. And this dictates a standard. Mm -hmm. And in the end of the day, I think the average quality of the role players that I get establishing in the guild, I am not talking of the people joining in that could just bugger off after two weeks. I am saying the people that establishes in the guild and remains in the guild to get to veteran or that kind of rank, they grow up in an environment which evolves them if they are not already um, good role players. I think that is a very strong aspect of the guild. We don't go lolling around. We don't just attack people randomly across the streets and just because someone is insulting us we don't start a fight uh, all of those things to me makes good role play good okay that's that's great um i think i totally agree on that you know it's better it's good to have a um a strong set of rules um and then see, on sorry go on grandpa you say something you see i i agree in the fact that you should promote a good role-playing society and i've and before you, once I found it, came on, I looked at your website, I must say it's very impressive. And I've looked on there, and it's a very length, it can be quite a lengthy application process to get into your guild. And, sort of, as GM to GM here, I would, I say, I'd say that, um, really, when I, if someone to me comes up to me and asks me to join the guild, I don't really care who they are. Provided they want to roleplay, and they could be the worst person in the world. Provided they want to learn, it doesn't matter to me. And I've often had people come at me and say, "Oh, you've got some really bad roleplayers," and I'll come back saying, "I know, but they're learning, and that's one of our foundations." Do you feel as if you could take someone on who is very new to roleplaying, can't, isn't very good with their grammar? Do you think you could take on those people, or do you think that they should learn first before they come and join you? Now we take um, beginner role players. Even we have got in the guild people that started fresh to role play. We have dyslexic people which cannot help their dyslexia. It's just a problem they have. They don't spell correctly. I've got people that don't punctualize or capitalize. Uh, this is not a problem. As I said earlier, we value the player. And some players are just pricks out of character pricks, which I don't want in the guild. If someone comes to my guild and is totally fresh to roleplay and has all the goodwill to learn, they're welcome. To fill an out of character application has nothing to do to your quality of roleplay or to your experience. You have some castings, you have to put the effort to fill them. If you cannot be asked to fill that amount of questions, well, probably you won't even struggle to try to improve your roleplay. This is my opinion. Let's say an out of character application is just a good will test on top of obviously asking like for your age, if you are 14 years old, I'd rather not have you in the guild because maybe at some point we get a prisoner and we torture that prisoner and someone could emote in a rather bloody way but we don't want to impress someone too young, so yes, we ask for the age. Uh, we ask on purpose if there are some role-play topics that could disturb you as a player. Again, torture is one of the examples. Uh, some players could be fussed about the war, the most brutal part of the war, where maybe one soldier is just scavenging across the field and finds the boots of a dead corpse or even the dead companion 
this one could be just a mercenary in the guild in character and is just plundering the dead from their belongings, be it coins, boots or anything. And some people at the player level finds, finds that disgusting at the moral level. So the out of character application serves to ensure that one player has not an out of character moral issue with what the roleplay turnarounds could be. No, that's I, I really like that. Um, you sort of filter through the applicants sort of before they even get to the IC on an OSC level. They already know whether they need, they want to join or they should join or not. And I think that's that that's a very good pro, you know, process. Um, especially if you get a lot of applicants. Um, I personally have um, always make sure I OCly talk to someone before they join uh, mm. to explain and I always say you know. The, how chilled the guild is etc and we we all have our own ways of doing things um okay so on to the next question so you've told us what the strongest aspect is what do you think the weakest is mm. call me a fool but i think it is potentially the same because the overwhelming amount of rules the out of charter application the rather long enlisting protocol like fill out of charter application and go through the in charter interview after reading the web page is something which can put people off um, so this is one of the two weakest points uh, and the other one is um, my character because meanwhile I am a very dedicated guild leader otherwise the guild would not, would, wouldn't be here since four years um, how I've designed my character seems to rebate much dislike around to sugarcoat the term mm -hmm. uh, because some people is more than just disliking me and the guild to extension um, but this is how I want to role play I think it is a very interesting character to role play um, so tough for them it's their loss in the end of the day if they don't want to role play with us but it is my policy to leave and let leave so yes the strong point is also the weakest point but besides how i've chosen to role play sean as vulnerable to an extent um not the white knight superhero that is perfect he has just this flow of being a man made of flesh and blood and desires of carnal nature mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand that. You know, there there are a lot of rumors that go around, and I think it's quite brave of you to, um, you know, to face them, but also not to, I guess, respond because there's a there's an overwhelming desire to want to snap back, and that's just human nature. We can be very aggressive, and we like to defend what we make. And I think that's I think that, I think as long as you keep a mature response, you know, the only th the only people I guess that are looking immature are those that would, you know, guess constantly reassert the same points over and over again the ones that we all have heard of some of us may not care but you know it's uh, the, you know the, it's out of the bag but in the end what happens happens and i think it's a very mature response of you to to kind of um to deal with it that way so if we move on to another question then um i have done rp pvp against you uh on talrog in the blackjaw clan um i fought alongside you in the war, war of opportunity yep so we both know that you that the balean retinue does love unrestricted rp pvp um some people call it just simply pvp because there's they think that there's no role play in it um, I wanted to know why you decided to go for unrestricted RP PvP as opposed to going with a set of defined rules that a lot of other people take. Okay, um, I'll set as premise more than the guild is just my preference, but as I am the guild leader, it turns into the guild preference and I expect the people in the guild to adapt. Um, say that. Um, I also underline the fact that we try to be flexible. And for the sake of creating a role play, we have also done, and I am still up to agree, even if it is not my preference, to do ruled uh, engagements. But I think there are many negative factors about them. Mm -hmm. um, the first in my books is the immersion. We have this marvelous thing that is transmog, which Blizzard provided us, which means with little effort, 
we can have uh, all the warriors have plate gear, all the rogues have leather gear. If I spot the enemy and I am in transmogged gear, I can just flag for PvP. I don't have to just poke for battle tag and begin to ask, which kind of rules is your guild using? And I'd spend 30 minutes in a random encounter with two full guilds watching each other doing nothing. Meanwhile, the guild leaders establishes rules. Unrestricted PvP, flag up, bang, and you have a battle. It's immersion. You spot the enemy, you could charge straight into them if you want to. Mm -hmm. This is first bonus. Second bonus, when you have rules, you have people that usually ends up to break those rules. So cheaters in other Either words. someone is just cheating, mm -hmm. maybe someone is pushing the wrong hotkey, and then the complaints start to fly. So it's like, my guild member whisper me, oh, this horde person has done this to me, it's against the rules. Then I have to go and poke the horde leader via battle tag. And then the horde leader has to poke his guild member. In the wild, there is a fight around us, ongoing, and we are just triangulating between our guild members and say, oh, you don't have to do this anymore. But they are doing this more and more, so I have to retaliate. And it grows and it grows, and then maybe it goes out of control. And in the while, you are not enjoying the event. You are just typing and typing and typing over. It's, I think those are very good reasons for um, choosing uh, unrestricted PvP. I, uh, as a PvP myself, I mean, I like it a lot. Um, but not a lot of people are used to it. And I guess if you're used to it, you'll, you will have a clear advantage mainly because oh. gear is an issue but no but that's that's like that's just uh, you know gear has always been an a, issue hasn't it a moment here to mm -hmm. me is not an issue uh, okay. when you play a character it's too easy to say oh i am the kick-ass war hero and then you are just in blues or let's say timeless isle mm -hmm. epics if you want to play a strong character in my eyes you should be able to back it up with your player skill and with gear. There is, it, it is an objective matter dictated by Blizzard. It is objective. It's not some kind of emote fight. It's not a role fight, which is luck-based. It's not just, oh, emote, okay, I am native English speaker. I can emote better than you because you came from Spain, maybe, and you struggle with English. And my emotes are all cool, and your are crap, so I am better. No, it's just an objective matter that is established by someone that is above the parts. It is even the official game mechanics. Mm -hmm. There is already one system to fight. The players don't need to find an excuse to give themselves to a fight. Cool. It's just because some people cannot even bother to cap arena or grind some honor or just do some looking for raid and get some basic gear to just be somehow competitive. Sorry, I don't take this kind of shit. If okay. you want to be kick ass, you give up. Fair enough. Fair enough. That I totally um totally have the right to your opinion and I think I disagree. Grandpa disagrees. Um we'll come back to that in a second in the debate. Uh, I feel like we should move on because we're going to start running out of time. Uh, as in this is is really interesting and I'm really enjoying listening to it, but I, I we should get through the questions and we'll come round it off at the end. Um so we've already heard that you think Sean as a character is maybe one of the weakest parts of the, the, the guild itself due to his um, human nature, which is, you know, never perfect. So what would you say, maybe in a couple of sentences, what is strong or admirable about Sean, in your opinion? He has a very strong sense of duty and is extremely loyal to his majesty. Um, this is the first point. I think he is very fair as a person in how he is treating others, which obviously others could disagree, but I think he has his own sense of justice and moral in how he's handling situations. Um, he's a paladin after all. Um, the role play of Sean is the mix between being a paladin and a noble with his duties and responsibilities. Um, like an eagle trying to take off and rule the skies, 
but it is grounded by his being just a man, a mortal, made of flesh with his uh, intrinsic weaknesses and feelings, which limits how much, how high he can fly. fly okay. Spell. Fair enough. That's, that's yeah, I, I feel like, you know, that's that's a good thing. I, you know, honor and, and um, loyalty is, is something that not a lot of people have. Um, um, not honor. Mm, let's not speak about honor. It, it is lay children, for example, or children with no problems. Ah, okay. He fights for his people. <laughs> the I, children of today is the warrior of tomorrow. Yeah, true. That's, that's fair enough, because to be honest, an orc wouldn't... Well, I don't know. I'm I'm not going to lie, I'm going to put this out there, um, and we'll talk about it at the end, but uh, there is a debate um, on the Horde side about um, the slaying of enemies' children, and what the I know the Black Draw um, um, have done um, ourselves uh, in that regard, and, and the topic of honour and such. So I'd like to talk about that in the debate. So I'm going to I'm going to note that here, but we'll move on to the final question. Um, Sean, if you could change one thing about Arjun Dawn for the better, what would you change? Or if you don't want to change it, what would you add to it to make it better? Or, or if you had a choice, you know, if you could add to it's it. It's a very tricky question, really. If I could change something, I would begin to change quite a lot of players. <laughs> but I think that's a bit over the top. I mean, it might be hard at first. We could arrange something. I'm pretty sure Grumper likes nuclear weapons. So we could attempt to nuke some of them. Can we do that? Someone mentioned nukes. Who could mention nukes? I'm here. I mentioned what? nukes because Sean was saying that he'd like to change some of the players. And I was saying we could arrange that because you like nukes. I'm not committing mass murder. <laughs> but you like nukes. Yes, I don't commit Probably mass murder. Probably some standards of role play, like some standards of um, just having standards, like everyone would PvP their battles. Uh, it would take that amount of time to travel from this kind of distance. Uh, just some standards which everyone could adapt to, but it's utopia in the end of the day, so. And f sort of PvP represents the realism in fighting in WoW. Do you, do you, do you sort of agree with that, or? Mm, I am not saying it represents realism. I am saying to stop, to agree to rules, it gives a breach in immersion which is different, but in the end of the day, one battle is just part of a plot line, it's not the plot line. So I, I just like the PvP part because it's fair, everyone can gear up in the same context, they have the same possibilities. Um, okay, brilliant. So that kind of ends it for our sort of guest interview, uh, in, and I thank you so much for uh, for answering all those questions. Um, it's really nice to hear what you would do to change AD, even if, like, obviously get rid of the player bases. Well, some of the players, is, I find it quite haters. funny. Haters. <laughs> yeah, get rid of the haters. Uh, I'm sure everyone would like their haters to go, but, you know, some of one person's haters is another person's friend, unfortunately, so I don't know how that would go. But, um, yeah, that was brilliant. Um, now, Grandpa, do you want to move on to law now, or should we put the debate in, seeing that we had a couple of things that we wanted to talk about? Um, uh, you st stick on the debate, I will get to my law eventually. Okay, okay. so we'll move straight to the debate of the day. So, um, you had you had the the specific debate of the day, didn't you, Grumper, um, that you wanted to mention? Um, yes. But before yes, we get on to that, why don't we discuss... So you said you don't agree with unrestricted PvP. Do you want to give us some of your thoughts on that? Grumper? You completely broke up for me, then what did you say? Did I? Oh, I'm sorry. There must have been the, um, the goblins. Actually, I don't think you're here, because I'm recording this, so I sound fine. <laughs> um, I said that uh, you mentioned that you did not like uh, unrest unrestricted PvP. No, I do like it. I, I don't... I say I, I've done both, and I do both. Mm -hmm. Because... I I like the fact I like unrestricted because the fact you can do anything you want. And you're a mage. I don't, and I, yeah, and I can use blizzards as much as I want to. What I don't like about it is that I have people in my guild who want who like the idea of being in battles, but haven't got 
actually hasn't physically got the time to gear up to get the PvP gear. I mean, Jake, you should know, you do tons of arenas. And Sean, I've, I did a random battleground with you once. You won't remember, but it was Silver Shard Mines. But, you won't um, remember, but I was there watching you. I was I was there. I was, I was gearing up for Siege of Orgrimmar because I needed to get some Valor. But, um... Wait, what? You went it to was, a, yeah, you went to the back yeah, battleground to get Valor? I was, I was half asleep at the time. It was one o'clock in the morning. So you pressed H right. and you queued up for a battleground. Something is bro Battleground. Okay. Right, okay. Uh, no, I was, I was half... I don't. It's it's also difficult because some people don't ha have the time. It's like it's like the same old thing of LFR and heroic raining. Not no not everyone has the time for it. Mm -hmm. So the fact that a lot of RPVP in a lot of ways based on what gear you have, and you may your character could be the one of the strongest paladins in the world. But because you don't have the gear, you can't do that. The point of RP is that you use your imagination to to do what the game can't. And the fact that sometimes a lot of it's revolving around gear means that the game is telling you you can't do it because you can't because you don't physically have the time. Yeah. And, and that's what I like. That's what I like about restricted in a way because you there's a health limit. I don't like the fact that there are, you can only cast a spell out like once every eight seconds and there's auto attack. But I like the fact that there are boundaries, so everyone at the very least has an even playing field. Yeah, that's that's He's, that's the best thing about it. I think that you know you with the set rules. But the issue that Sean brought up was if we get into that, and every guild has different rules, every guild has different expectations, and people do cheat with unrestricted PvP. You don't get cheating. I mean, so far as to the fact that. Mm -hmm. Resing and well, well, I mean, but you know that, that's the only rule. Yeah. But the the issue the issue I found with especially Spina Calendar, I enjoyed the campaign to an extent, but a lot of my guild began to find the RPP monotonous because we just got constantly attacked for them and we couldn't do anything else other than get attacked. We eventually just up sticks and left. But there was a monk in an undead guild, and they're a very heavy RPP field, and I bet they know who they are. But they had over a million health. How the hell? And they and they had they had attacks which could three shot me. I mean, I'm a mage anyway, so I'm squishy. But still. Yeah, you, sh you should that... see warlocks in full siege of Orgrimmar. That's hilarious. Sort of hundred k incinerate, hundred k incinerate, hundred k incinerate. That's mental. Yeah. Um, I know. I totally see your point. Um, that there has to be. A degree of fairness about it, oh. but it's the age. It's the age of question. Sean, do you wanna? Yeah. Well, the point is, we are all role-playing guilds, so in my eyes, it's extremely hard that you get the hard mode raider into our role-play guild, or that you get the supreme pvp rated battleground hero maybe you get the um, like pinka for example uh, she role plays and she's in verdict but she's not in a role play guild that's an exception but usually in the role play guild you have a mix of people that in general either don't give a fuck and have crappy gear or at the best just raid flex raid normal maybe or Cup arena. So when we get to battle roleplay guild against roleplay guild, um, there shouldn't be that huge massive difference. Maybe there is some guild which is better than another. Uh, but besides, let's not forget the griefers. When you are fully geared, the griefers tends to not exactly get in to gank everyone with two spells. Which is another big feat. Um, the only thing I really appreciate of a ruled roleplay PvP is that you can take amazing screenshots. Yep, that is true. Amazing screenshots, totally worth. Um, let's move on then. If you agree with this, or you don't disagree, or you don't agree, with it, I just stepped on a plate. Um, Clever. Yep. <laughs> uh, if you agree with it, or you disagree with it, let us know in the comments below. 
and we'll we'll take that into account and maybe even talk about it next time. Um, next topic of debate: child killing. Now, Sean, you mentioned that Sean would not hesitate in killing orcish or whore children by you know with that with that quote, which is you know like uh, what does it remind me of? It because I really like it. I just uh, I wouldn't be able to say it off the top of my head. Uh, if you want, I can just go on the longer terms because um, I appreciate realism. In the end of the day, to maintain armed forces, you need an economical backbone. Mm -hmm. The sword of a, of a soldier, there is a blacksmith doing it, that's a civilian. The food as well is made by civilians. So, um, civilians for some are already off, off limits. They are innocent for some people. No, they are what allows a nation to fight. Uh, and the child, in the end of the day, in the future, will be either a fighter or a civilian which can produce swords, axes, what not. The law is pretty clear about it. Thrall, yes, Lorewise has also saved Azeroth, but it has also led the orcs in our rebellion uh, from their containment um, in the camps, yeah. in the yeah, internment camp, camps, yeah, camp, yeah, and he has led the horde uh, away to Terramor, and they have fought. There has been the battle with Admiral Proudmoor. Um, so yeah, in the end of the day, if Thrall would have been slain instead of grown up, there could be many ifs at the present. Many people of the Alliance would have been still alive and. What if the Alliance itself, instead of a world shaman, would have got um, the strength, the power to still defeat Deathwing by other means? I don't know. I'd personally say, in in counter argument to that, personally, if they had killed all the orcs in the entire and not had the internment camps, killed all the orcs that remained in Azeroth, I don't think they would have beat Archimond at the World Tree that required the orcs, the humans, and the night elves. To come together and work together to, in order to stop the demons and the undead of course um, I think without the orcs the extra manpower I don't think they would have been would have done it because in the end the plague ravaged most of Lordaeron and although Stormwind is a strong was a strong um, bastion of human power it was still reeling from a lot of you know um, a lot of the damage done by the orcs in the first war and obviously you know I think yeah, it was weak. Yeah, I would have. I would definitely have said that. And it, your Grand Alliance was broken up as well. Like, so I, I genuinely would have thought that. I think personally that the Orcs escaping was a good thing. But I understand where you come from in in terms of Sean's point of view. Now, the reason why I wanted to talk about it is because there's been a lot of, um, maybe, I guess complaints thrown at what the Black Jaw did in terms of killing, you know, human children. Um, I think, the savagery of the clan sort of sees it in that way as well um, but they're also very honor bound and depends on the, what the honor is like orcs orcish honor is definitely for fighting from the front and and not being a coward and stabbing from behind and killing someone that's defenseless but it but in the same way people might not be I guess so naive to believe that when you kill the parents of a child the child feels that's their natural right to avenge yes, said parents also. when they grow up yeah Obviously, um, besides, if let's say a, a human bandit, a, a rebel, Van Cleef, if Sean would have got the hands on the daughter of Van Cleef, maybe the daughter could have been introduced in the human society and educated and grown in a different way. Maybe in a golden cage or in, in an illusion that her father has died like a hero uh, instead of being a bandit kingpin, for example. But she's a human and would have been among humans. If you get an orc child, what would you do? Um, and this is where he links to be a paladin and his compassion virtue to him says to just give a swift and painless death, death to the orc child instead of, you could leave it like alone in the woods, maybe some wolf will devour it, maybe. Or alternatively, raise it in a society that hates it, which would be leading to suffering. In, yeah. in that sort of yeah, I totally see where that, where they're coming from. Cool. Um, I just wanted to get an insight from you on that. Do you, do you want to say something as well on that, Grandpa? Yeah. 
Both my main characters, Grandpa and Faldor, would never murder a child. A child is too innocent. A child, a child has not found their way in the world. A child could, in fact, save their lives one day. They could, it doesn't care if they're the enemy or not. They could kill them. But at that point in time, they are defenseless and they can't do anything. Exactly. I don't think Edrisil either would, would, would be able to strike down a child. For the same reasons that it's defenseless, if there is an issue, they will talk about it when they're older and when they're able to rationally understand what goes on. You know, I think I think that's an important. Uh, with a war ongoing since practically thirty years, so generations, mm -hmm. uh, Sean simply thinks it's safer to not have a, a threat at all. So it rather erase it because in the end of the day, yes, that orc could save his son or could kill it, for example. But by how history has been, it's more probable in Sean's perception that the orc could kill his son or the son of anyone else. Yeah, I tell, I tell you see history that. History of war. Mm -hmm. Of course, yeah, that's like that's the rationale behind it, and I tell you think I think that you know you all three of us have our own opinions on it, and they're all very vi valuable um, and and viable completely. Um, should we move on to the next topic? So I'm just quite conscious of time. I don't want to go to you. Uh, I'll just a very quick disclaimer about of it. Of course. Even if you speak a lot about this, uh, in the end of the day, the possibility that you get to roleplay that situation is almost impossible because yeah. practically no one is roleplaying children. So at worst, you find it in a Dungeon Master event, which is a private affair probably for your own guild. Mm. In the end of the day. Exactly, but if some people find out about it, they may take it in different ways. It's it's a very sort of, I guess, difficult situation. But on that, um, I'm going to say, uh, if you have any comments on that, if you think we're right, or if you want to add your own opinion, please message us below, and we'll talk about it next week as well. Um, on to the final part of the de well, the main debate of the day, as opposed to questions we've come up from. Do you want to sort out that, Grandpa? Seeing that you proposed it. Yes, we have as always, if we're going to do a big topic and debate, I will delve into the forum and see what's ticking off around AD. And I came across something by Tutti, and, hello, Tutti, at least I hope it's Tutti, it was Tutti last time I checked. And... Drum roll. Yeah, it was Toots, damn it, I always get, it was Toots, so close. Where did you get um, Tutti from? Tutti Fruity? I, I've been having too much ice cream. Um, it's Tutti Fruity and ice but, cream. I didn't even know Tutti that. Tutti Fruity is an ice cream. What? I you guess need to come on hot, you need to come with me to Spain one day, my friend. I'll show you the best ice cream parlor around. I guess I just um, stick to vanilla all the time. But yeah, go on. Sorry, digressions. And the qu the question is: Is resurrection slash reincarnation feasible in roleplay? And would your character be able to have the power to resurrect, or has been resurrected themselves? And then I mentioned later on. Would you would you have bring back a character that might have died? I don't know, like in two thousand eight, as a Draenei, but you're gonna you could bring them back with one as a Draenei. You're gonna maybe things like that. I don't know. But that's what I wanted. To, that's one. I, so you mean like resurrect a character I mean. in terms of resurrect him in a different story, as well, not just like uh, resurrection yes, in general. Yes, definitely. Yes, in, in through a different story. I mean, you got perhaps Iron Hall Azrael. So you could uh, imagine if Grandpa was to die today. And then Warlords of Draenor, you can you can see him thirty five years younger. My God, he was an idiot back then. Never mind. Um, so, but still. But does that does that mean that we are going to see, we're going to see what Azeroth is like as well? But then I thought they wanted to invade present day Azeroth. They do, oh. but, the, but here's the thing: we are role players. Many things can happen which Blizzard don't want to touch. Okay. Such as they don't they don't want to deal with our Velen and Paranormal Velen, so. Things are going to happen. Mm -hmm. I see what you mean. That's it's interesting. That. that I think. Um, but anyway, let's let's concentrate. Resurrection, Sean. What do you think? Um, it's a viable form of role play. Uh, depends how you do it, not if it is good or bad. Um, you could even gather a few paladins, priests, or whatever, and for example, perform a rite. You can even try to do a Dungeon Master event just for the ride itself. Something could go, could go wrong in the process. Um, it, really, it has to be out of character communication with whoever wants to be resurrected, 
you have to take forms of, of agreements. Um, you could even play it that, for example, you have to, to give life to someone else, you bind the life of this someone to you, to yours, uh, like it's your holy energy that keeps that person alive. If you die, that person dies as well. There could be other reasons, like the soul migrations, everything can happen really, as long as no one gets their feet stomped and it doesn't sound too much drama llama. Um, I'd say there is one must thing in the terms of the out of character agreements. If someone has slain you and you agreed that this person was going to slay you, you should also have the agreement of this person that your character is allowed back. Just because probably then your character wants also to have a go to this person. I would get pissy if Sean is going to slay someone and after a few days I get this someone as a ghost trying to harass me or trying to resurrect and perform a form of vengeance in some transversal way. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, I'm going to step out there for the sake of debate and provide a counter argument and say that I don't think resurrection is viable because as much as um, it's implemented in game I personally think that the ability to pull someone back from the dead is an incredibly powerful tool and it means that in a roleplay perspective no one should ever fear death and no one will ever fear consequence is that a good thing or not? well that's I guess that's what, up to the individual to decide but personally I'm gonna go with the fact that resurrection shouldn't happen because it takes away the real cons the real life consequences of people dying and people do die in WoW and don't come back you know so it's, it's gonna happen and I I'd, I'd like I mean the one major example of resurrection that I've seen is Sylvanas but that was only with the sacrifice of many of the Valkyr I've never seen the game mechanics be used personally on, on another person in I guess a major story outcome but you know I'm, uh, I'm not a law master I haven't I, seen me. I can I can step in here okay go uh, and when and when resurrects Varian in Varian short story which is on the Blizzard website well, there we go then but then again Anduin is an exceptional human it depends on where you put the power on. Personally, I think it messes with consequences. Although there are many who will say I can't talk. If you know me from ER, it has happened before. When you know, back when I first started role playing, uh, one of my major characters got resurrected through Soulstone. So I guess you know, um, I've been on that side of the coin, and I never got the end of it. I always got so much stick for it. So weighing it up, is it worth or not? I'd rather take the consequences and re-roll. So. I think that's one major thing we should think about. If you disagree with me, please do message below. But, uh, Grandpa, did you want to say anything else um, on resurrection? Um, resurrection is viable, although the person doing it will most likely kill themselves or be incapacitated for what I was doing in the first place. Wait, sorry, could you, would you be able to say, say that again? Because it lagged out for me. The gob, the oh, Avenger... Are, the we Aven back, are we back to the chief again? The Avenger Co has decided to strike once more, so you're gonna, you might have to do that again. Pretend as if Ben is saying, you know, oh, James, you know what, I, I can't... I oh, fucking this, I can't do it! I Seriously, this is so bad! Oh. Okay, resurrection is vi... Resurrection is viable. Okay. However... The person resurrecting will either kill themselves in doing it, or be severely weakened. So, you could imagine having a young human priest who resurrects something. They could they could take on the appearance of an old man for many weeks before they're finally back to full strength. Okay, I see. That's quite an interesting way of taking a look at it. I like it. Um, right, so I feel as if we've talked quite a bit about it, and if we're looking at the time... Um, should we move on to your law section? Talk about what time? How long we've been going? Well, how long we've been going? Well, from what it looks like, we are probably over an hour now. Okay, we'll save my law section for another time. Are you sure? 
Well, it's just, it's just yes, a sub sure. show. Well, we had such interesting debate, and I just... I guess that's what happens when, when things get really interesting. You just want to keep talking about it. Okay? So we're gonna... It will give... It will give me... It will give me a week to come up with... To get Cadgar, Velen, and Morad done. And you're just gonna go for it? We'll, right, okay, we'll... so we'll dedicate dedicate that to, like, episode... What are we on, episode 4? Episode 5. Five. Episode 5 will have a big bit of lore. Um, do we have anything else to say, then? Uh, no. Other than you can... Other than I've been Grumper. And I've been Edrisil. He's been Edrisil. And, and this is Sean. Sean's been Sean. Yeah. Yeah, and thanks for having got me here today with you. That's alright, we've enjoyed it. It's been a great talk. Um, oh, crap, before before we go, I just, wanted, right. I just wanted to also say an official apology to everyone for the uh, the contents of last week's episode. Uh, what at the time we thought was incredibly funny and uh, enjoyable, it turned out to be um, maybe we're going a bit too far and uh, I've already tried to say on the thread you know how much we uh, we apologize for everything that go on um, and we're looking to improve as always. So if you do have any like tips or comments, please let us know either in the forum post yep. personally um, you know on um, uh, on the YouTube uh, page, video, whatever, that'd be great. That'd be fantastic. Um, and yeah, I look, we look forward to next week. So I'm going to say goodbye from me. And before we go, I am going to say you can find us at RatchetRadioAD at gmail.com.